There we go. Technology is great until you have to try and figure it out in the midst of people staring at you. Well, it was a hot summer morning in June, Ray, Colorado. I was in probably uh, just after the fourth grade in an upper room in a non-Methodist church where uh, an older woman who had volunteered as a vacation Bible school director set about trying to teach these newly minted fifth graders the Lord's Prayer. You ever tried to teach someone the Lord's Prayer? You ever realize how hard it is to remember the whole thing when you're put on the spot and you're the only one who's supposed to say it? Occasionally, yep, yep. That was my, that was my learning. I'd heard the Lord's Prayer every week of my life. In church, my dad would wrap up his pastoral prayer and he would, he would wind up the way I tend to do and invite the congregation with those subtle cues. It's time to start, you know, uh, waking up and realize it's time to, to pray, right? It's time to, to, to give your part that you know, the, the, the part we now print in the bulletin. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, etc., right? get into that prayer. I'd heard it, but I, I had never committed it to memory, so I would kind of babble, you know? Anybody with me on that one? Anybody remember what it was like to be new in church, and suddenly you start getting to that point, and everybody starts talking, but you don't know what to say? It's a little freaky. Yeah, it can be a little freaky. But you just kind of mutter along, you know, a little bit of watermelon, watermelon, watermelon. No one knows the difference, right? You all know what I'm talking about, right? And yet, in the fourth grade, this, this lovely woman, I don't even remember her name, couldn't pick her face out of the crowd because I was too involved in my fourth grade little world, right? We did this joint vacation Bible school thing in Ray. Every church in Ray would pull together and we would do a joint Bible school and it would rotate. So it wasn't at my church, it was at some other church up the street. And we were in their, their room and she had written it out on the chalkboard, an actual chalkboard back then, right? And, and we were going through each line. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. By the end of that week, we had it committed to memory. Fast forward to seminary when I started leading worship for the first time in earnest. And, and it was finally my job in the midst of my second year of seminary to uh, stand and deliver the, the prayer for the people. right? And so I would do what we would call a pastoral prayer. And at the end, you, you do that wind-up, right? And you've heard it every Sunday for most of your life, probably, if you've been a churchgoer very long. You, you've heard that wind-up, and, and, and then you get into the prayer, and you just start rattling it off because you've rattled it off a hundred times or more, at least. Except now you're the one speaking into the microphone, and everyone's following you, and the people who are saying watermelon are looking to you to know what to say. And for some reason, the third stanza goes right out your mind, and you can't realize it. You can't remember it to save your life. And you start muttering like you've never heard it before in your life. Anybody lead worship? Understand what I'm saying? <clears throat> you been there? Bob knows what I'm talking about, right? So, so it, it's, it's kind of funny. You think it's kind of funny, but really it's, it's practical that, that I've seen pulpits with the Lord's Prayer printed out and taped to it so that, so that you can sit there and read it, because if you don't, it could get ugly real quick. It could get ugly. It could. The Lord's Prayer could become so automatic, though, that we, we forget its meaning and power. We forget that it has a deep and profound meaning in our lives and that it was the prayer that the Lord gave to his disciples. For Ash Wednesday, uh, 10 days or so ago, the, the scripture reading is is winding up into the don't uh, be public with your with your practicing of your religion right and there's several examples of it but it's in chapter six of Matthew you go back and read it if you want but there's this section if you read if you, if you look up the scriptures for Ash Wednesday it kind of goes from this verse to this verse and then it skips some verses and then it goes from this verse to that verse and being the curiosity person that I am, the curious person that I am, I, I go and I look up what was missing, and the thing that was missing just brought joy to my heart because uh, I realized where I was going after we started Lent, and that was the part that had been holed out of the middle of this sixth chapter of Matthew for Ash Wednesday was Jesus teaching the disciples to pray the Lord's Prayer. 
And I thought, how cool is that? Just teed me right up. I'm ready to go. So that's the, that's the theme. For the rest of Lent, I'm so grateful to Lori filling in for me last week so that I could be away to celebrate Raven's birthday with her and, and take some time to recharge and, and uh, uh, wear myself out on a mountain. It was, it was a lot of fun. So I'm so grateful to have wonderful lay preachers, including Lori, to, to step into this pulpit and to share the word with you when I can't be here. But I'm so ready to be back, and I'm so excited because we're going to spend the next, the next uh, five Sundays and, and a couple of weeks in Holy Week, including Resurrection Sunday coming up. With the, this whole series, we're going to take a look at different parts of the Lord's Prayer until we've got it all kind of laid out. Now, the Lord's Prayer gives us a, a pattern for prayer. We've, we've reviewed that before. Last Advent, we talked about prayer, and I preached on the Lord's Prayer and, and shared with you the pattern that exists, the, the way of praying. It's not just the specific words that Jesus gives and uses in that Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. It's the pattern that he gives. And that can be important. That can be important. If you're interested in that, I can point you in some good resources to, to plug into there. But today, I want to talk about how it also gives us the important content of prayer. An important content of prayer. These words are not just thrown together. These, these aren't words that Jesus just made up on the fly when his disciples came to him and said, teach us to pray. He said, well, let me see. Uh, how, about, uh, how about this? No, that's not. So that's not Jesus. Jesus knew. Jesus knew what he was doing, and he was intentional about the prayer that he gave them. Not that it's the only way to pray, but that it's an important way to pray. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take this series, unpack the content of these various phrases in the Lord's Prayer, one at a time, so that by the end, hopefully, we will be filled with faith, filled with the Spirit, filled with the knowledge of of who God is and who we are and how awesome what God has done for us can be. Today, I want us to take a look, and if you're interested, if, you, if, you're, if you've been watermeloning it for a while, okay, and you, you're not sure exactly what the words are, they're, they're in your bulletin. So you can grab a hold of your bulletin. I also want you to grab a hold of your Bible and turn uh, to that passage, that familiar passage in, in Luke 15. We'll get to that too. But we're going we're gonna to start with the first phrase, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That, that's our first phrase. That's our phrase for today. That's our phrase for today. This is not just a fancy and flowery, churchy way, right, of, of starting the prayer. This isn't just sort of like, well, this isn't the part that really matters. Uh, this is just sort of the wind-up, you know, sort of like the, the dear so-and-so in a letter, right? Or the, we got to come up with a fancier way of, you know, going, hey, God, right? You know what I'm saying? You, you, ever, you ever been trying to pray and you're not sure how to start? And just like, uh, 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 what's up, God? Not, not many of you. Maybe the youth have done that. I don't know. But through this, this isn't just a flowery, churchy way to start the prayer. These ten words are a powerful, action-packed declaration of who God is. These ten words are an absolute power-packed declaration of who God is. And today... I want us to unpack that declaration. Who is God? Who is God? And why does it matter? Because Jesus gives you all kinds of clues, gives you all kinds of information in the way he begins this prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. These opening lines, they really have three phrases, don't they? Three phrases, and I want to, being a good preacher, okay, I want to take those three phrases and make four points. Are you with me? Some of you are laughing. You know it. You know it. We're on this, though. We're on this. We're going to take these three points, or three, three phrases, we're going to make four points. The first phrase, uh, or the first point I want to make only gets us through the first word. What's the first word of the Lord's Prayer? Our. The first word in the Lord's Prayer is Our. Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus says, pray like this, our, our. You see, God never intended Christianity to be a solo endeavor. 
God never intended faith to be something you did on your own, all by yourself. You see that? We haven't even gotten to the second word of the prayer, and we've already come to one of the most profound things that is missed by Christianity in our culture today. I can't tell you. It's got to be something about our, our, our society, that, that sort of uh, really uh, individual, I can do it, pull myself up by my bootstraps kind of American way, right? That I can do it on my own. And we get into faith and we're like, I can do that on my own too, God. I don't even need you sometimes. We might not say it, but it's the way we live, isn't it? And if we don't really even need God by the way we behave, we certainly don't need other people. They just kind of get in the way, don't they? They challenge what we think and, you know, bring up stuff that might be important for us to know. And I don't know. God never intended Christianity to be a solo endeavor. And the weird thing about it, if you talk to people from across the country, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but Colorado's a little weird. It is. It really is. I, I've encountered Methodists from Tennessee and from Georgia and from Texas. I got a cousin who's a pastor in North Texas, right? My dad's from Minnesota. Some of those Minnesotans are a little interesting too, right? Everybody's got their own quirk. We got our very own Dexters here from Indiana. The Methodists are a little quirky there too, right? Right? Okay. I've been to school in New England, and man, they are really weird up there sometimes, okay? But the truth is that Colorado is a little, a little weird in that we kind of reflect the, the West, the way we became the United States in the West, in that not only do we have that I can pull myself up on my bootstraps, do it on my own, I don't need anybody kind of American mentality, but we kind of have this sort of frontier, Western sort of don't bother me, I'm going to dig a hole in the ground and strike gold kind of, you know what I'm saying? There's, there's sort of this rugged, I'm really going to do this thing on my own, and I can prove it because the people who came here first were just crazy enough to come here on their own, right? There's, there's, this, there's this sense that we can do it by ourselves, but here in the very first word of the prayer that Jesus teaches those disciples, he reminds us that we're not supposed to do this on our own. We can't do this faith thing without God for certain. Otherwise, what would be the point of prayer? But honestly, we can't do it without each other. This is a plural you can't be alone in a room and pray this prayer with sincerity because you're not an hour unless you're connected with a community of faith. Our Father. We are a community. Why are we a community? Have you ever read up on predators? I'm serious, like predator. You ever watch like Animal Kingdom, right? And, and they have the predator, and there's, there's the cheetah like hiding in the grass, right? Or the, the lioness, you know, coming up on a herd of zebra, right? They don't go after the strongest one in the center of the pack, do they? Who do they go after? They go after the sickly one that's off by himself. So what happens to you when the enemy wants to take you down? If you're in a pack, if you're in the middle of a congregation, if you're in the middle of a community, a small group that can say, hey, you're going down a bad path. Hey, you're not, you're not going anyplace good. Hey, you might want to listen to the Lord here. Have you read this? This might be important for you. Let me pray over you because you need the strength of the Lord and the strength of community. The enemy's going to be like, man, he's got some armor. I'm not going there. I'm going to go get the one who's decided that he can do it on his own. Because he's sickly. And by himself, and away from the protection of the Lord, away from the community of faith. This parable that Jack read earlier today, it's only the third in a series. If you read the whole 15th chapter of Luke, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a trilogy of stories about the lost. First you begin with the lost sheep, and then you have the lost coin, and then finally the lost son returns. We typically call it the prodigal son, but if you go back to the lost sheep, you go back to that lost sheep, who does the shepherd go to find? The shepherd leaves the 99. If, if one has 100 sheep, the shepherd leaves the 99 to go and find the one. Why? Because the 99 are going to be fine by themselves together. But the one who's lost and by himself is going to be at risk. We've got to find that together. We've got to pull them together. We always 
need our alone time with the Lord. Hear me now. Hear me now. Jesus even teaches this too. Get alone in the secret place and pray. We always need that alone time with the Lord, but we can never allow ourselves to be isolated from the family of God. We can't let ourselves get isolated because that's, that's the quickest way to get ourselves clobbered by the enemy. Look at the prodigal son. Look at the prodigal son. It's different from the two other stories because you see the, the lost sheep is about the shepherd going to find the lost sheep and the lost coin is about the woman tearing apart her house to find the lost coin. And, but this passage here is more about the experience of the lost himself. What it's like to be the lost son who goes astray and needs to be found. Those stories are mostly from God's perspective, right? The, the first two are from God's perspective. God is the shepherd who goes and leaves the 99 to find your lost sheep. And God is the woman who tears apart the house to find the lost coin. But, but this prodigal son story, this is the story of, of us, is it not? This is the story of you and I wandering from the safety of the fold. going astray. But what does he do? What does he do? He, he gets his inheritance and, and he, after a short time, he gathers up everything he owns and he leaves. He goes off to a foreign land, not connected with his family, not connected with his community of faith. He isolates from those who have a voice in his life. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about when you isolate yourself from someone who has a voice in your life? Someone who will speak into your life and, and you just can't ignore it? You know what I'm talking about? There are people out there who will try to speak truth into your life and you just be like, I don't like you. Uh, you haven't treated me well. I don't even have respect for you. So I'm going to go and do my own thing. I don't have to listen to you. But there are those people in your life, are there not? Wives, can you get an amen? There are some people in your life who can speak truth into your life and you can't ignore them. You can't ignore them. There are times where I will be just down. I'm telling you what, I had a time recently where I was just down, depressed, not feeling it. I was trying to whine to my wife, you know, I just wanted her to listen and I'm going to whine to you. Because I'm going to whine. Anybody ever be like that, right? I just want to tell you how awful things are. I want to tell you how bummed I am and how, how it's not my fault, right? And my wife just looks at me because she can speak into my life. And she goes, have you taken that to the Lord in prayer? Man... Here I wanted to whine, and now you're sending me to God. See? Pastor needs it too. Your pastor needs it. Anybody relate to me on this? There are people who can speak life into you, who have a voice that cuts right through your nonsense and puts you back on track faster than anything. But one of the reasons we isolate is so we don't have to hear that voice. You know what I'm saying? We just get away from those people who are going to speak truth into our life so that we can just whine. Because I just want to whine. I want to complain. Of course, the reason I go to my wife is because I know deep down in my heart that she's going to tell me to take it to the Lord. She's going to cut right through my nonsense and tell me where to go. So we can't isolate. We've got to let those people have voice in our life. But then he ends up alone, doesn't he? This prodigal son, he ends up all by himself. He thinks he's got it all figured out and he's going to... He's going to just do whatever he wants to do. And then he ends up all by himself, all by himself, but worse than that, he's isolated and envious of the pigs he's employed to feed. He's literally envying the pigs that he's employed to feed. That's how isolated he gets. So far, so down. Isolating usually begins as a choice, you see. Isolating usually begins as a choice, but always ends up as a stronghold. It always ends up as a prison. You might start down that path with a choice. You know what? I don't want to go to church today. I don't need those folks. I'm good. Me and the Lord, we're good. And then the next week, you know, I don't really feel like the church thing today, you know. I'm going to sleep in. Me and the Lord are good. It usually starts as a choice. 
And then before long, a choice snowballs into, well, you kind of get a pattern. And then by the time you get a pattern, then the enemy will come out and say, you're by yourself. I'm going to come clobber you. And you come and get clobbered. And suddenly you find yourself in a prison of your own making. Isolation starts as a choice, but it ends up as a stronghold. It ends up as a prison that you feel trapped in. And you can't get away. Don't let yourself be isolated. Lord have mercy. Can you believe I'm only one word into this thing? Okay. That, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of gospel for one word, right? I'll tell you what. Well, we're on to the second word. Okay, we're, we're going to pick up the pace here in a minute. But we're on to the second word. The second word, what's the second word in the prayer? Father. Father. Okay. Our reminds us of the community. Father reminds us of the relationship we have with the Lord. Now, there is no better picture, I would contend, there is no better picture of God's fatherhood than this parable from Jesus. This parable of the prodigal son, the lost son found by the father. These first two parables are, are more from the searcher's perspective, right? They're more from the father's perspective. It's the shepherd and it's the woman. But this parable... This parable of the lost son gives us a more accurate glimpse into God's true nature, you see. God loves you so much that he'd leave the 99 to find the one. God loves you so much that he'd upend the entire house to find you if you were lost. But this parable gives us the most accurate glimpse into God's true nature as father. Because, you see, God hasn't lost us. That's a great spot for an amen. You ready? God hasn't lost us. All right? We have wandered off. Unlike the sheep who's been lost by the shepherd, God hasn't lost you. Unlike the coin that was misplaced by the woman, God hasn't lost you. God hasn't lost us. We have walked away. But here it is. God's waiting for us to realize that we're lost and turn to him. Because you see, when you realize that, when you find yourself in that isolated prison that started as a choice and has now become a stronghold, when you find yourself in that deep, dark place, all it takes is a turn. And God is there. You don't even have to walk the road. God is there. God is already there. He hasn't lost you. You might have lost your way and felt like you were lost to God, but God hasn't lost you. God knows right where you're at, and God is waiting for you to turn. And when we do realize it and we do turn, God is right there ready to throw the party, you see. Ready to throw the party. I love the language previously in in these previous two parables. At the end it says, verse 7, I tell you there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons. Who need no repentance. And then over the lost coin, he says, Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And then what does the father do when he sees the son far off and he puts the robe and grits the ring and gets the sandal, does all the thing, brings him in, and what do they do? They throw a party. God is not just going to be like, All right, you sit in the back because you wandered away. Okay? God is going to be like, No, no, you come in. You have found your way back. You've recognized that I didn't lose you, and now you're right here, and we are going to throw a party, and it's because of you. That's why when we have those opportunities to give your life to Christ in here, I always try to remind you, don't be scared, because you're full of a room of people who know what it is to be where you're at, and to give your life to the Lord. And who wouldn't want to cause a party in heaven over one sinner who repents? Who wouldn't want to do that? It's an awesome thing. God is right there and he's ready to throw the party. And then as a father, as father, God created us. God created us. Without him, there is no life. And in turning to him, he gives us new life, you see. He's the foundation of it all. He's the source of it all. This father. This father that we need. It's the way Jesus talks about God. It's the way Jesus refers to the Creator as Father. Okay, we're going to pick up the pace a little bit now, okay? 
going to pick up the pace a little bit now. So the, the next phrase is, Our Father, who art in heaven? I just noticed that my, uh, my uh, program here uh, spell corrected art into R, so it says, Who are in heaven? That doesn't make a lot of sense, right? It's a little flowery. Who art in heaven? Right? Our Father who art in heaven. It's important for us to recognize that this little phrase here, who art in heaven, our Father, who art in heaven, is not about God's address. Are you with me? This is not about God's address. Turning, he is instantly there. You are God's address. Do you realize that? God is right there, ready for you to turn. You are God's address. This isn't who art in heaven isn't about where God is because God is everywhere. God is with you. God is with me. This is about reminding us that God is not an earthly father. God is not an earthly father, but our heavenly father. This isn't about where God is. This is about who God is. God is not like your father and my father, as good as they might be. God is our heavenly father. Now, I have been incredibly blessed to not have just one, but two incredible father figures in my life. Not to mention the grandfathers that have been a part of my life. I cannot tell you the lessons that I have learned from the men who have stood up and shown me what integrity is. I had the blessing of being born to an awesome dad. So incredible, in fact, that he inspired a lot of why I do what he does. Followed in the family business, so to speak, right? But then, when my parents separated and divorced and God took that mess and turned it into his glory, my mom married my stepdad. And my stepdad gave me very different than my dad in a lot of ways. Showed me a different picture of what it is to be such a great father figure. Such a great father figure. I got two great dads in my life. It's fantastic. Yet as awesome as they are, I know they fall short. I know they fall short. They fall short just like each and every human dad does. I was just talking with my dad on the phone last night, and uh, I admitted to him uh, uh, a struggle that I have in calling my family. Anybody have that one? You just sort of get tunnel vision, and you forget to call mom and dad, right? Okay. Some of you are all great. Some of you are here with mom and dad today, and that's awesome. I love you guys, but... But I tell you what, uh, I get in tunnel vision, and it's work, and it's someone's in the hospital, and i got to get the kids to practice, and we got to pick them up from school. And before long, it's been a month, and I haven't called mom. And I'm like, shoot, I really need to do that. My dad called me, and I said, you know, Dad, I'm just really, I'm just really not great at that. I need to be better at that. And he goes, yeah, you know, you might be a little bit too much like me in that way. <laughs> yep. My dad isn't perfect. My stepdad isn't perfect. Tell you what, as I just about had to re-sew some buttons onto my shirt as I listened to Jack uh, read the scripture today. That's awesome that he's old enough to... I thought how appropriate that my son would be the one reading the scripture today. I just love that. It's fantastic. Love you, buddy. All right? That's just fantastic. But I know that no matter how hard I try, I'm not going to be a perfect dad either. I'm going to screw that up. I'm going to screw that up. Now, fatherhood is an awesome picture of who God is for us. It's an awesome picture, but we have to remember that it's not about our earthly father, because I know I am incredibly blessed with the fathers that I have in my life. But I am also aware that there are people out there who grow up not knowing a dad. Or worse yet, I know people are out there who grow up knowing their dad is abusive or alcoholic or terrifying. And that is not the picture you want of God. That is not the God that Jesus wants you to know. So if that's you, I want you to hear, this is the good news for you today, in that God is not just a father, God is our heavenly father. God is all the best attributes that humans could ever muster up to be a dad. And more. God is our heavenly father. I am all too aware that we have an experience with fathers that, they don't just fall short, but really break it. But God is life. 
Our God is like our Heavenly Father who never falls short. God is our Heavenly Father who never falls short, who always shows up, who never, ever forsakes us, who forever is there to wrap His loving arms around you and welcome you home. That is God. And if that isn't your picture of a father, I got a good word for you today and that you have a Heavenly Father who is that good. God is his Father, our Father, who art in heaven. And then the last phrase, hallowed be thy name. If there was ever a more mysterious phrase, right? Anybody got your Shakespeare on? Okay. Get, get your mind into that kind of frame of mind, okay? Hallowed be thy, I don't, what was the last time you used hallowed in a sentence that didn't involve the Lord's Prayer? Anybody? Anybody think of that time? Yep. Hallowed. You ever come across those words in the Bible and you're like, that isn't really a word. <laughs> and if it is, it hasn't been used for centuries, so we need to find a new word. Okay? Hallowed be thy name. It's kind of a cool word, though. It's nice to say. Hallowed be thy name. Whether you pronounce it hallowed or hallowed. Okay? Hallowed is a strange word. It means to sanctify. It means to set apart. It means to make holy. So, hallowed be thy name is to set apart, to make holy, to sanctify the name of God. But there's an interesting twist. I don't know if you noticed this. Unlike, unlike the previous phrase, right? Who art in heaven? That's kind of a present and always kind of thing, right? Who art in heaven? This one is actually referring to something that's happened already. There's a past tense here, right? There's an ed there, all you, all you English folk out there. Okay? Hallowed be thy name is a past tense. It's the past tense of hallow. Hallow is the act of in the present blessing or sanctifying or making holy the name of God. But this is hallowed be thy name. It's a past tense. It's already happened. Here's the, here's the word for you. It's settled. The matter is settled. God's name is already holy. God's name is already sanctified. God doesn't need us for his reputation, you see. God doesn't need us for his reputation. God is holy whether we acknowledge it or not. It's already a done deal. It's already settled. Been settled forever, literally forever. God is holy. God is sanctified. The name of the Lord is hallowed already. It's hallowed to the point that we read in Scripture that there are seraphim flying around the throne of the Lord singing, Holy, holy, holy. And we repeat that refrain when we come to the table and have communion. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. You see, God doesn't need us to be holy. You hear me? God doesn't need us to be holy, but that's why the good news is so amazingly good. God doesn't need us, and yet God still desires for us all the more. Doesn't that just blow your mind? Just blow your mind that God is so holy and doesn't need us at all, and yet God desires you and me. Not just all the human race like we're some sort of collection but you and me intimately. He wants you to give your life to him. He wants you to love him as you love your neighbor. He wants you. All right, so here's the conclusion. The, if you looked in the bulletin, you're like, he hasn't even gotten to the title yet, but trust me, we're wrapping it up here. Okay, God is dot, dot, dot. Right, we're going to fill in some blanks here. You ready? Okay, three blanks. Three blanks. God is ours. God is a heavenly father, like nothing you've ever experienced. God is already holy and sanctified. In short, God is God. That's kind of stupid, simple, isn't it? But it's true. God is God. And it is that God 
to which we pray. Now, you ready for your homework? Thought I forgot, didn't you? Lori, did you give him any homework last week? No homework? All right, well, you got to pass. Okay, you had a substitute. Sometimes you have the most fun with substitutes, don't you? Okay, so here you go. I've got some homework for you. All right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about, I want you to pray about, I want you to, to spend some time with the Lord exploring how you have experienced fatherhood in your life and how that might inform knowing your God as Heavenly Father. And that could be thinking about all the great things that your dad was or thinking about all the great things a father figure was in your life. Maybe it was a grandfather, maybe it was a stepfather, maybe it was just a kind man who fathered you. Right? Think about all the ways that you've experienced fatherhood in your life. And how does that inform your knowing God as Heavenly Father? There could be some ways that you need to let go of, that you need to leave behind, that you need to get rid of. Those two. Think about all those ways that you have experienced fatherhood and how is that informed, good or bad, your knowing God as a Heavenly Father. How have you experienced fatherhood falling short? Because you know you have, let's be honest. I could admit to you the ways I've fallen short as a father, just as easily as I could see the ways that my father and my stepfather and my grandfathers have fallen short for me. That doesn't mean they're bad, it just means they're human. Okay? So how have you experienced fatherhood falling short? That's your homework. Have you experienced fatherhood that informs your, your understanding of God as the Heavenly Father? And have you experienced fatherhood that falls short that you might need to let go of so that you can fully embrace God as your Heavenly Father? All right, you got it? Okay. I want to pray for you. You ready to pray? Let's pray. Let's come to that. Glorious and awesome Abba Father, we are so overwhelmed by your presence. We're so overcome with your love, and Lord, we've got a lot, we've got a lot to do. Lord, we pray that we would come and experience you afresh as our Heavenly Father, that we could join the Heavenly Host singing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Lord, fill our hearts, fill our voices, overflow our spirits with a sense of your holiness. And yet, may we know you as intimately as a father to sons and daughters. Lord, we pray these things. A supernatural, awesome, overwhelming encounter with you this week for each and every one of us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.